will, I will keep going through the bell. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, actually learning these parameters. So here's a question for the audience. How would you describe the professor in this photo? Right, so there are four, four classes. You can describe the professor as easy, mean, boring, or very nerdy. Right? So that's a hard problem. Um, but imagine that we had a classifier. And a classifier is a function that takes his input, let's say this image, and it's going to, as output, pick which of the four categories is most applicable to the professor that is in the image. Now, it's not actually going to say which professor. What it's going to say is it's going to output, let's say it's going to output a probability distribution on how likely it is that the professor in the photograph is of those four categories. So the input is actually it is an image, and the output is actually going to be a vector of four numbers, which are the probabilities for easy, mean, boring, nerdy, and so on. And this black box is going to be one of these deep networks at the top. Now, recall that these large networks may have you know, tens or hundreds of millions of parameters. Now, efficient ones may only have a few million parameters. But we have millions of parameters that we need in order to, to, that we need to set so that if we input some image, we do all these convolutions, all these convolutions, all these convolutions, and then what comes out the very end is a probability distribution that makes sense. So in this case, the output of this network says that there's a 52% chance, or 52% confidence, that that professor is a nerdy professor. Now, the question is, well, how do we magically set these 10 million or 100 million numbers so that comes out to be true? So how are we going to do that? I have a million magic numbers. If I get them all to the right values, in other words, if I set all the convolution weights just the right way, when I produce, you know, when I send this black box a picture of a really, really easy professor, well, it should probably say 0 0.99000. So here's how we're going to do this. We're going to, so, so if I taught you something, if I have to teach you in class, usually I like to, to give you a bunch of examples. I don't just talk about things abstractly. I give you a, a, an actual example. I say that if you need to learn how to do something, here's one practice problem. Here's another practice problem. And I give you the answers to those practice problems. Um, in fact, I'll give you the answers to practice problems three later today. And so let's say that I gave you the answers to this particular problem. So these are a bunch of professors at CMU. Uh, maybe uh, others will come give lectures here too. Um, and let's just say that there was a database that students created where they gave every single one of these pictures a label. There are sites like ratemyprofessor.com, those kinds of things. And in fact, students do give professors labels all the time. So, and in this case, I've decided to label all of the pictures of B as a nerdy professor. So let's just say that the world agrees that if you see a picture of me, this network should classify that as a nerdy professor. So let's say that a picture of me comes in. And notice that this picture of me is different from all these other pictures of me. Right? There's one, you know, that's, that, this picture does not exist in this data set. But it's a picture of me, and the network was told that the right answer is that whenever you see Kayvon, that's a nerdy professor. So let's say that this image comes in, and the output of the network, or the right answer, should have been 0001. Because Kayvon is a nerdy professor, means that that's the right answer. But the network actually produced this output. It actually was, was fairly close. Um, 
So we need a way to change the parameters just a little bit so that the output is much more close to the actual answer that we want. And so we need a measure of how wrong the network currently is. And that is usually called the loss. How much is the network wrong? And so in this case, if this is the right answer, and this is the answer that the network produced, I just I need to compute the difference between the right answer and the actual answer. And that's the loss. Now, that loss we can think about as just being like an L2 distance on vectors. But a common loss is this <coughs> softmax loss. And a softmax loss <coughs> is we get, we get, well, I don't want to go into too much on why this is a, a reasonable loss function, but we can look at this and gain some intuition about what it's doing. So the softmax says we're going to take the value of the correct category. So the correct category here was nerdy. But I only gave it 0.52. So I'm going to exponentiate that value. And I'm going to divide it by the sum of all the other categories. So think about it as if, if the output of the network was 100, zero, zero, what would the loss be? It would be log of 1, which is 0, no loss. Makes sense. If the output of the network was 0 for the nerdy category, and 1 for some other category, what would the loss be? it would tend towards um, negative infinity, right? Like if, if, I, if I said, if I was very confident that this, this professor was not nerdy at all, this would be the log of something close to zero over some other number, which would move to negative infinity. So the softmax loss is doing something very intuitive. If you stand up and say, this is definitely this, and you're wrong, you should get hit really hard. So the loss is high. So we're penalizing really confident wrong answers because that's the worst case scenario. We would rather be kind of 50-50 eh, than saying, I am completely right and this is the answer and be wrong about it. So that's what the softmax loss is doing. And of course, during training, I'm going to give a whole bunch of examples. The network is going to output um, its answer and I can compute the loss for all of those examples. And I can just add them up. So if Li is the loss for the i image, L is just the sum of all of those losses. OK, so imagine you have a loss and it's not 0. That means that we can do some more training to make the network better. So how are we going to change the parameters to reduce the loss? Well, one answer is if you have loss, you can randomly choose one of those 100 million parameters, and you can tweak its value a little bit and see how it went, and keep tweaking the, 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 the values randomly. And hopefully, at some point, you find some magic set of 100 million values when the loss is low. But in fact, there's much smarter ways to do this. Right? So to give you a little example, let's imagine we have a simple function here that takes two parameters. P1, P2. And let's say that we want to set those parameter values so the function is 0. We want to minimize the function. But with the current values of P1 and P2, the function outputs 10. And now let's assume that I also gave you the derivative of the function with respect to those two parameters. df dp1, df dp2. So df dp1 is 2, df dp2 uh, is negative 5. Or in other words, I'm giving you the gradient of this function. So if you wanted to make the function 0, how would you change the parameters, given the information of these derivatives? What do these derivatives tell us? How should we change p1? We should make it bigger. We should make it smaller, because we know that if we make it bigger, the function's value will go up. If we make it smaller, the function's value will go down. How should we change P2? We should make it bigger, right? Because that will decrease the value. And if I had a choice between changing P1 or P2, which one would you choose? 
P2 because it's more sensitive to P2. So in other words, what we're doing is we're saying that if this is a plot of the value of F, where blue is zero and red is a high number, and my current values of P1 and P2 put me here in P1 and P2 space, I just need to walk in the direction of the negative gradient. So the derivatives tell me how I should change the parameters to get closer to my target output. Or in other words, if I have a loss, and I want to make that loss zero, the derivative, the gradient of the loss, tells me how to change the parameters. So this is our basic training procedure. While the loss is too high, for each item in the training set, so for every image, evaluate the loss, evaluate the loss gradient, so compute the gradient of the loss, and then adjust the parameters, so this is a vector of parameters, adjust the parameters by the gradient times some step size, which means how, how much you want to walk in the direction of down here. So the only thing left is how do we compute this loss gradient with respect to millions of these parameters. And this is where your algebra from, from high school, or maybe before high school, comes in. Not your algebra, your calculus side. So imagine we just had a simple function here, like uh, f of x, y, z. Now I'm going to rewrite it as uh, so it's x plus y times z, I'm going to rewrite it as a times z. So if I ask you what the derivative of f with respect to a is, well, you wouldn't hesitate at all. You would say, well, the derivative of az is, is very much z. But the derivative of az with respect to a is z. And the derivative of a with respect to, to x and y, well, well that's, that's 1, right, since a is x plus y then the derivative d a d x d a d y at 1. Okay. <clears throat> so by the chain rule, back to high school, is the, the derivative of f with respect to x is the derivative of f with respect to a times the derivative of a, a with respect to x. No problem here either. So d f d x is just z. d f d a z times d a d x at 1. And it actually makes a lot more sense when thinking about neural networks to draw this out as an expression. So here's the expression for this function. And on the outputs, I'm putting the value of this sub-expression. So z is 5, y is 4, x is 3. x times y, or x plus y is 7. And the total output is 35. Make sense? So now we're going to go backwards and compute this gradient. We're going to do this very mechanically. So what is the derivative of f sort of with respect to, to f? You know, that's just 1. And so if I have inputs to f, if I change this number just a little bit, so this is the value a, right? Because a is x plus y. So if I change a just a little bit, well, whatever I change a by is going to get multiplied by 5. Because the output is going to be a times 5. That's the, the output of that. So if I change a by 1 unit, f is going to change by 5 units. So df dA is just 5. If I change z by 1 unit, well, the amount of the output change is going to be 7. So df dz is just a, which is 5. Let's keep going. So let's just say if df dA is 7, and I change x a little bit, well, what, how much does a change? Well, if I change x a little bit, a changes just by one unit. So that's dA dx. Well, then df dx is also 5. Because df dA was 9, or was 5. And df dx is just df dA times dA dx. So that's also 5. 
So there's a very simple mechanical pattern that starts popping up if you want to compute the derivative of the total output expression as a function of any of the inputs. So you compute the, the derivative of, the, the, of f with respect to an output, and you just propagate it back. And then here you have the derivative of a with respect to its inputs. You keep moving backwards using the chain. So in some of I can do this completely pictorially. Like if I have a plus, so if the change in the overall function with respect to this node is 10, well, this node's derivative with respect to x is 1, and this node's derivative with respect to y is 1. So the whole function's derivative with respect to x is df dx is df dg, which is 10, times dg dx, which is 1, and that's 10. So in other words, derivatives just get copied through a plus. Well, let's think about a max. Well, let's say that g of x is max and that df dg was 10. So if I change x a little bit, the output of that node will change only if x is greater than y. So if I have an output, sorry, if the, if the derivative of the max node is 10, well, I'm going to copy that derivative to whichever input link is greater. And multiply if, DG, <coughs> if the FD node is, uh, is 10, then that means that the derivative is just swapped. You just multiply the input times the guy on the other side. So g equals x times y, dg dx is y, and dg dy is x. So if d loss, you know, df dg was 10, that means that dg dx is 10 times y, which is 10 times 12. So addition propagates gradients. Max chooses a gradient. And multiplication multiplies the gradient towards the times the input on the other side. A very simple set of rules. And so now since I have addition, multiplication, and max, all of a sudden, I can now perform this operation for an entire unit's worth of work. Because that's all, you know, a unit, remember, was multiplication, addition, and max. So if the, the derivative of loss with respect to the unit was 10, well then, the derivative of loss with respect to the dot product, the overall dot product, would be y, and we'll let y be 10, if y is greater than 0, or if, if this output is greater than 0, and 0 otherwise. And then everything else is pluses, so the y's just fall through. Then we have multiplies, so y's are going to get multiplied by the thing on the other side. And now we have derivative of loss with respect to the original inputs all the way up the chain. Now, I'll skip this a little bit if I haven't shown you what happens when a weight is used multiple times in an expression. But um, it's pretty easy to show that when a weight is, multiple, uh, is used multiple times in an expression, its losses just add up. So in a comb layer, um, these weights get used in many, many pixels. So the loss for a weight is the sum of all the gradients from all of them. Now last, I told you that normally we, we like to phrase these, these computations as linear algebra, as matrix vector products. So the output, or the weights, I can think of as a vector of weights. And the input is not just an x, but an entire image or a matrix x. So x times w is actually a matrix vector product to get the vector y, which is how we wrote it just in the last lecture. 
that the W times matrix X is the output Y. And that means that I can just look into the matrix to figure out the derivatives. So what is matrix element Ji? Well, matrix element Ji is how much um, the output at y, yj changes as a function of any change in the weight. Because any change in the weight is multiplied by, any change in weight 2, or 2, is multiplied by this coefficient in changing the output. So I did just a little bit of algebra here, is that the change in loss with respect to y uh, so the, change, the change in loss with respect to changing a weight is the change in loss with respect to a change in some of the elements of y, which can come from change in output elements of y as a function of change in w, which is just an element of the matrix. And it turns into a propagating the gradient before was multiplying by the other side. Now it's just multiplying by the transpose of the, of the matrix x. I'll let you kind of look at that off, offline, but it just means that computationally, if, if I'm evaluating the network with forward multiplication, if I want to evaluate the gradients going the other direction, if you give me the input gradients of uh, the derivative of loss with respect to the output of the unit, I can compute the derivative of loss with respect to the inputs of the unit by multiplying by the transpose of the matrix, which is quite clear. So the training process for these deep networks is exactly, we'll put it all together, is for every training sample, perform forward evaluation of the network. So do that really efficiently, like last lecture, to compute the loss. You want to evaluate the network to get its prediction. So you can compute the loss compared to the right answer. Then now that you have the loss, you can compute the gradient of the loss with respect to the last layers of the output. And then you just keep multiplying by matrix transpose all the way back through the network to get gradients for the input parameters W. And then once you have D loss D parameter gradients, we'll update you know, all 100 million weights by multiplying by or adding in those gradients times some particular step size. Now, one of the reasons why some of your friends who are in machine learning might go, oh my gosh, I keep running out of memory while training, which might be something you've heard them say, is that um, let's think about how we have to allocate memory when we are evaluating the network. So for evaluating the network, we have inputs to a layer, we evaluate the layer, and we get outputs. And then we can immediately get rid of the inputs, just like that. So we only have to keep one layer's worth of output around at a time. Whereas when we're training a network, we have to keep them all around at a time. So we have to evaluate the network, but we have to keep those of the activations around because they need to get multiplied by the gradients when they're coming back up. So we can't stream the data through the system. So imagine having a network with 100 layers. You have to keep the outputs of all of those layers around. And you also have to keep around uh, uh, information like the gradients. And in more sophisticated schemes, sometimes you actually have to keep information about the acceleration of the gradients. This is the derivative of the gradients as well. So these uh, training sizes can get big pretty fast. Um, and so one of the challenges of, uh, of training, in uh, training in parallel, or training on modern computers, is actually fitting all these intermediates in memory, in a few gigabytes of memory, which is what GPUs have. So I'll summarize it like this. Is while loss too high, for each item in the mini batch, or in a, in a batch, evaluate the gradients, and then update the parameters. So, um, yeah. 
So, so I guess up until now, I've said for every item in the data set, and I'm going to say for every item in a mini batch, which is a small sampling of images in your test set. So now let's think about paralyzing this thing. How would you paralyze it? So first of all, can we paralyze this loop? It's hard to paralyze a loop that says while not done because you kind of need the previous iteration to, to work on. So what about uh, uh, this loop? For each, item, for each image that we're going to work on, let's parallelize over the images. That seems maybe possible. Um, every image will contribute loss and gradients. We can calculate them separately and then we will sum them up. So that seems kind of possible. Um, and uh, evaluating the loss gradient sort of is, is taking, evaluating the network for one image, and we might be able to parallelize sort of in that as well. And of course, the update step, this is really easy for all parameters in the vector plus equals of another vector, that's, that's pretty true. So this workload is what is causing every leg to be very concerned. So last lecture, evaluating the network was very expensive. And now we have to evaluate the network for thousands of images and repeat for maybe thousands or tens of thousands of steps. So we need to evaluate the network millions or millions of times. So this is why training a deep network may take um, you know, days or weeks on a, on a single computer. So there's a large memory footprint, tons of computation, and uh, there are some dependencies that are hard to deal with. Okay. So let's slowly build up some parallel solutions. So, Matt, okay, so there's my code. And let's think about parallelizing the outer loop across two computers. I'm going to have to partition the images across two computers. I'm going to have each computer compute um, the loss gradient. Then I'm going to have the barrier. And I'm going to reduce the gradients because I need to compute the average gradient. Right, so if, I have, if you do 10 images and I do 10 images in the batch, we have to sum together those gradients, and then we will perform the update step. This is the output. So I want the average gradient for all the images in the batch. So I compute per core gradients, average, barrier, and then update. Now, this is the thing that's going to hurt my scalability, is these barriers. So, and I would like to use maybe a cluster or something like that to accelerate the training. It's going to take too long if I try and do this on one GPU. Now, if I go buy a cluster and connect it with Ethernet or something like that, those nodes are going to be very, it's going to be very expensive to communicate between the two. So, there's a few modern tricks that are being used to parallelize stochastic gradient descent, or this training, <clears throat> this training method, these training procedures, on large clusters. So here's how I'm going to set this up. I'm going to use four of my computers in the cluster are going to be my workers. And there's going to be one of the, the, the nodes in the cluster that is responsible for scheduling the whole computation. So one of the nodes in the, in the, mission, in the uh, cluster has all the parameters. So on starting point, what it's going to do is it says, OK, we need to do one round of training. So let's divide all the images, divide the images across the four nodes. So I give each of the four nodes, let's say, 1,000 images. And I also give every node um, a copy of the parameters. So now every node has a copy of the parameters. So it essentially has a copy of the network. And it has 1,000 images to run on. 
So every node is going to start performing its own gradient descent. It's going to take some of those images, run them through the network, compute the loss, compute the loss gradients, and then update its local copy of the parameters. Or, or not, not update its local copy of the parameters. It's going to compute its own copy of the gradients. So based on those images, these are the gradients of the loss. And let's say that worker 1 gets done first. Worker 1 is going to actually communicate the gradients that it computed, computed back to the server. It says that based on the data you asked me to do, these are the updated gradients. Oh, sorry, these are the gradients. And then the server is going to compute an updated set of values for the parameters. Now normally, we would have taken the gradients from all four of the computers, averaged them together, and then updated the parameters. So we would have had all the computers wait for each other and go, oh. Now, but we're not going to do that now. We're going to update the values of the parameters, and we're going to send worker node 1 back off to keep going. So at this point, worker node 0, 2, and 3 are actually computing gradients using parameters that are a little bit old. A little bit old. And so at some point, worker 3 gets done, sends its gradients to the uh, server, and the server will use those gradients to update the parameters again. And it gets, and worker 3 <coughs> starts working on new images now as well. So now it's kind of interesting that process node 0 and node 2 are working on the original version of the parameters and computing how wrong those versions were based on their images. Nodes 1 and nodes 3 have already computed an update, have already, are working on updated values in the parameters, and they're now computing how, how wrong those parameters were. So the answer has changed. So if without parallelism, what we were doing was every time taking the right step to go, for example, right downhill, and then computing another step to go right downhill. Now every worker is sort of computing approximate steps. Because, well, I may not have the most up-to-date values, but I'm still going to walk downhill from here and it'll probably be OK. So this is a very asynchronous way to compute these things, is that everybody is working all the time. Everybody is saying, I don't care if the landscape has changed. I'm going to compute parameter updates based on my version of the landscape. And I'm going to hope that it hasn't changed very much. But down, the direction to walk downhill is still the right direction. Now, these systems have many other uh, optimizations in them, too. Like, for example, what happens if we wanted to use 1,000 nodes in our cluster? And we came bottlenecked by the server. Well, then there's a lot of techniques that we can use. Like, for example, we can split the server into one of the servers handles half the parameters, and the other server handles the next half the parameters. But we also have a problem of what happens if the entire deep network doesn't fit on any one computer. We've parallelized this problem across the images that we are training on, but we haven't parallelized any one implementation, oh sorry, we haven't parallelized any one evaluation. So some solutions, <clears throat> some systems will say, you know what, we should try and use two workers to parallelize the evaluation of this network. And so, some, and so solutions will do something like, you know, we'll give half the input image, the top half of the image to this computer, the bottom half of the image to this computer, and as we're evaluating the network, they need to exchange just a little bit of information uh, to evaluate the whole network. So if a network is too big to fit on one computer, you can evaluate really big networks by partitioning the network in space across two computers. So putting it all together, some of these parallel training schemes will have groups of computers working together 
on one end on, on some sets of the input images. And whenever they're done, they're going to send their parameter values back to the servers. And the servers will continually push updated parameters to the various uh, uh, copies of these workers. And this is roughly how many of these systems, like uh, uh, distributed cafe or TensorFlow, work to parallelize training. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, of work has been gone on to be able to make it async uh, to be able to run asynchronously uh, on these sort of low performance clusters. Now, some people have said, well, we would prefer not to have asynchronous training. Because if I do work on not up-to-date data, you know, that's actually, it's not as good of work as if I had up-to-date data. So there has been some work on trying to run deep network, or to do train deep networks on systems that have very fast interfaces, <coughs> so that we don't have to do any of this asynchronous. So NVIDIA is shipping you know, now supercomputers that have eight GPUs in the same box with a really fast network. And other people have said, you know what, even though machine learning training was always done on big clusters, maybe we should be using supercomputers with really fast networks in order to parallelize those computations more efficiently. And recently, there have been two very interesting papers, one from Berkeley and another from Facebook last month, that have shown that you can actually have all these barriers. You can do it exactly almost like the sequential code. You can say, I'm going to divide all the images across all the processors. Everybody will compute gradients. We will wait, average the gradient, and then take one step. Um, and it's possible if you have very high performance networks and you give all the processors enough work to do all at once. So the, uh, um, I put these links on the website if you're interested more. But here's examples of on a supercomputer parallelizing onto 128, uh, getting a 50x speed up on 128 GPUs. And then there was a, a paper just uh, last month, I think, from Facebook, where they showed that you could get, I think, a 90% speed up, you know, like your almost linear speed up on something like 256 GPUs, um, as long as you increase the amount of work per GPU to be substantially large. So the, it is an open research question whether it is better to use this asynchronous work on stale data approach or use a more tightly coupled uh, never work on a synchronous approach. And people don't know what the right way to do it is. But people do it in different places. Uh, different um, so when I was at Wuxi last uh, Thursday and Friday, um, so the, the folks there are implementing their own DNN library to do training using some of the algorithms I just talked about to try and get it to run really fast across 10 million cores on, on, on private wires. And so uh, I think their code is online right here. Um, they call theirs uh, uh, Sunway DNN, uh, their framework. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see uh, how well the training can scale with thousands of cores. Um, because uh, some of the, the work being done on, in these papers are using hundreds of GPUs, which you know, if we think about a GPU having thousands, each GPU is having thousands of cores, these are, this is training across hundreds of thousands of cores. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how well we can do if we try and parallelize training across millions of cores. Um, because right now, the biggest problem for uh, people that are trying to do deep learning is that whenever you want to train, you go buy a really expensive, as many GPUs as you can, and you still come back three days from now, four days from now, to see uh, what parameters the model has come up with. It is not a very good way to work. I mean, and imagine that every single time you compiled your code on the site, you couldn't see how well it ran until tomorrow. That is exactly the state that we are in in machine learning right now with deep networks. And so people are very interested in trying to scale out as wide as possible or use ASICs to make single node performance even faster in order to get days and days of training down to minutes a week or minutes or hours. So that's sort of where the world is right now. Um, 
And, and hopefully now you can go off and, and read a lot of the papers about this stuff. I think from uh, uh, these two lectures, you probably can go off and understand it. So on the course website, I've placed a large number of, uh, of papers uh, that you might be interested in. Everybody's always interested in this. So I, 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 I gave you uh, uh, a number of interesting papers on on understanding what these deep networks for image processing are doing. This is actually some of the references that I used to learn. Um, and then I gave you a bunch of papers on people that have taken the initial results and come up with networks that are not only better quality, but significantly smaller number of parameters and lower compute costs. So this is a, a very beautiful paper from Google. Uh, and then there are other, this is a new paper from this month, or last month that is uh, networks designed for mobile phones. Um, and then these are some examples of hardware for deep networks, like Google's Tensor Processing Unit, uh, sparsifying the networks by dropping weights. And then I have a few examples of uh, recent training algorithms. Or not training algorithms, but recent parallelization of training algorithms, uh, like the parameter server approach, which is asynchronous, and these two recent papers on scaling parallel training out to hundreds or maybe uh, even more, a couple hundreds of GPU. And as you can see, you know, these are 2016, 2017, 2017 references. So uh, most of this is kind of the state of the art in how things are done. And uh, as you can see from the news these days in China and everywhere else, um, trying to make this workflow run faster is one of the most important computational challenges uh, these days. So hopefully you might have fun reading some of these if you're, if you're interested in this topic. So uh, I think I will stop there. And uh, long day for everybody. But at least I got done like 20 minutes early. OK, so any questions about any of this? I, I really like the, uh, the, the TensorFlow tutorials are really elegant. So uh, if you want to get interested in this stuff, Flying around with TensorFlow is probably where I would start. And TensorFlow is paralyzed using the asynchronous approach. Okay, cool. I'll see everybody on Wednesday.